Yes, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, James told me that, that maybe not everybody is a neuroscientist or an electrophysiologist, so I will try and introduce what we do and the topic of neural motion uh, in, in general terms, try and, and put that in context since I will be talking about a number of different model systems. Um, much of what we do, and especially since uh, moving to Germany, since we've moved uh, model systems, is embedded in um, some kind of evolutionary context. And I think that uh, neuroscience has evolved tremendously over the past uh, 40 years and has lost a lot of uh, the comparative aspect with which it started. And as you'll see, much of what we do is, is, is really important to think about um, in, in, in the sense of, of, of comparing uh, systems uh, to try and find principles from these comparisons. When you bring in evolution in neuroscience, there's at least two ways of exploiting what you can get from uh, this type of understanding. And the first one is to look at the past to explain the present, sort of uh, exploit this uh, principle of inheritance of what's been developed and invented and evolved earlier. And so this applies mostly to uh, mechanisms, to molecules, uh, developmental processes, and so on, and uh, illuminates our understanding of structures as we can study them today. So we've applied that to a number of different systems, and one of them has been, for example, to look at the evolution of cortex. So we work on, uh, among others, the forebrain of reptiles, uh, because reptiles happen to be the only other uh, vertebrates, amniotes, than mammals to have a cerebral cortex with well-defined layers. And since reptiles and mammals co-evolved from a common ancestor, amniotes, that must have lived on Earth about 320 million years ago or so, by looking at the reptilian cortex, we think that we're probably looking at something which is much closer to the ancestral cortical structure. And by studying that structure, trying to understand how it works, we'd have some kind of understanding of the basis of cortical computation. By chance, um, I had a wonderful postdoc join the lab who is a molecular biologist interested in evolution and development, uh, Maria Tosquez. And um, she decided after looking at the complexity of reptilian cortex that it might be fun to do single cell transcriptomics on this system. And this effort, which took several years, proved incredibly uh, fruitful and interesting for us because it allowed us to identify all of these sub-regions of the forebrain, um, the identity of which we didn't know. When you look at this overall surface of these large cortex, it's impossible to say where the boundaries are and whether any one of them, of these areas, correspond to anything that's known, for example, in the mammalian brain. And so that has led us to be able to uh, identify within that cortical sheet regions that are, for example, homologous to the mammalian hippocampus. And you find that uh, within that cortex, the medial part of the cortex here has a set of three main stripes that are parallel to one another along the anterior-posterior axis that each correspond to the dentate gyrus, the CA3 field and the CA1 field that you find in the mammalian cortex. They are homologous from a transcriptomic point of view. That has allowed us to also find an area that is most homologous to what will become the neocortex of uh, mammals with its six layers. And other pallial regions that we didn't expect to find, for example, are things such as the claustrum, which is a weird elongated area that's stuck under the insular cortex of the mammalian brain, whose role is really uh, not well understood, that also exists in the reptilian brain. And this, that is in totally different regions in two different species of reptiles, in turtles and, and in lizards, for example, and yet constitute a uh, transcriptomically homologous region to the mammalian claustrum. So we're studying all of these regions in different functional contexts. Another extremely useful result of this kind of approach allowed us to look at the identity of the different cell types within the reptilian cortex. And for example, in this case, the interneurons. And we found that the interneurons can be classified uh, 
in main classes that are defined by their uh, embryonic uh, origin and their site of origins, and so defined by the ganglionic eminences from which they come, such that they can, they can be characterized exactly in the same way as uh, mammalian interneurons. But then the subtypes that you find within each one of these classes diverge in the mammalian and reptilian lineages. So you find Martinotti cells, cells that have been called Martinotti cells, for example, in the, among the mammals. You find cells that contain and has express, express some of those Martinotti-like genes, but you cannot characterize them as Martinotti cells from many of the phenotypic characteristics that they have in mammals, for example. We've done the same thing with ex excitatory neurons, uh, looking for homologies with layers uh, that one finds in neocortex, etc. So this approach is, in a sense, allows us to understand the nature of these uh, cortex, extant reptilian cortex, and related to the common ancestor that it has with uh, mammals. It has also allowed us to look at aspects of evolution that is more functional, such as the evolution of sleep. Sleep was first um, studied in mammals, in humans and cats mostly. And much of the understanding of the nomenclature that we have about sleep states, for example, comes from these studies. Um, sleep in mammals is characterized by two main phases that I call slow wave and REM, or rapid eye movement or paradoxical sleep. And typically, during a night, for example, we oscillate between the two with a long phase of slow wave sleep terminating in a short phase of REM sleep, and then the cycles start again. In the typical night, we go through about six or seven such cycles, and the fraction of REM sleep keeps increasing throughout the night. Okay? REM sleep has been discovered also in birds. Birds are a side branch of the reptilian tree. Birds also are the only other homeotherms among the amniotes. But REM sleep had never been found in reptilian, uh, non-avian reptiles. Okay? So the idea was that REM sleep was a modern invention that occurred in parallel by convergence among the two types of homeotherm amniotes, the birds and the mammals. And it was somewhat related to a higher development of their brain, their cognition, related to homeothermia and a need for feeding and, and other related uh, behaviors. In fact, by, by chance, totally, by sticking electrodes in the cortex and the, the subcortical pallium of, of reptiles and keeping the animal plugged in during the night, when we analyzed the data, we saw things like this, which is an oscillation between two state brain states during the night, each of which corresponds to something that is very similar to what you observe in REM and non-REM sleep in mammals, with certain bands of, of oscillations and uh, frequency that oscillated uh, very regularly with a cycle length of one and a half minute going through 50% REM, 50% uh, slow wave and 50% REM, repeating that every one and a half minute throughout an entire night, throughout seven or eight hours, going through something like 350 sleep cycles. It's as if there exists within that reptilian brain First of all, circuits that generate slow wave, circuits that generate REM, and a clock that allows the system to cycle through them in a very regular fashion. So that has led us now to study those mechanisms that underlie the generation of this alternation between REM and non-REM sleep, something which is deeply mysterious and we still don't understand. So this is another axis of research in the lab, trying to understand uh, the nature of these sleep uh, features. Another way of looking at evolution and considering it uh, within neuroscience and the kind of neuroscience that we do is to uh, emphasize the aspect of convergence. That is that uh, many aspects of the way in which circuits function in the end, compute, uh, generate an output, uh, are the result of convergent evolution, meaning something which is separate from the specific implementation uh, by molecules, synapses, neurons, etc. And I want to give you a few examples of this also to illustrate. 
So if you look at the tree of life and the evolution of life over the past nearly 4 billion years, so nearly as long as this planet has existed, the first 3 billion years of evolution was basically pre-cellular, then uh, unicellular, bacterial mostly. Eukaryotes evolved something like a billion years ago. Um, multicellular organisms evolved something like seven, 800 million years ago. The first nervous systems arise something like 700 million years ago. And then in the Cambrian, there's this explosion of species that led to a wide variety of animal designs and so on. This is when brains start to exist for real and, and diverge in principles. So the first few billion years of life, of the evolution of life, are those in which all the molecular components are basically invented. All the ion channels that we know, all of these uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptors and so on basically were invented by bacteria. Uh, sodium channels, potassium channels, uh, acetylcholine receptors, even TTX, you think of it as coming from the liver of a fish, it's actually generated by bacteria themselves within that liver. So this is the first sta uh, stage of, of evolution of system. This is what gives us all the building blocks with which we build synapses. Then during this period of, of diversification, uh, nervous systems are invented and then undergo their own evolution in parallel paths, uh, from parallel from one another. And then you get this diversification and this complexification all occurring in parallel independently of one another. And the thing that's interesting during that time is that all of these different life forms and animals have to deal with the same external world, the same physics of the external world, and therefore have similar problems to solve. And the result of this is that some of the forms of the solutions to those similar problems end up converging, even if the implementation of the solutions may differ. And this is what I think is interesting, is that those common constraint, constraints to uh, the evolution of these nervous systems lead, in some cases, to common solutions. Okay, And I would posit that those common solutions at that level represent the principles of neural science as to how you solve a problem at some algorithmic level independently of the implementation details that you might have uh, the opportunity to use. Okay? So we're somewhat interested in those principles and what I'm going to talk about now, this neural motion, this dynamics of neural circuits is in a sense some, an illustration of this thing. Of course, these diverse systems themselves are differences. Life, after all, is finding a niche and adapting to your environment. And of course, there exist differences. Um, the difficulty here is to identify those things that are common and that might define principles. I want to give you an example for these kind of convergence of principles. You see here the action potential and illustration of the work of, of Hodgkin and Huxley. So we all know the action potential is generation, the underlying uh, biophysical principles, which at the time of Hodgkin and Huxley was, was not really known at the, the channel resolution. But we know how to describe it, and this description applies to all the action potentials, plus or minus some variations and so on. It's an electrical pulse, about 100 millivolt in amplitude, about a millisecond duration, plus or minus uh, something. And uh, this represents the digital signal, oral non, that is used by most neurons to communicate and compute. Okay. Now, a few years ago, there was a really interesting paper on a bacterial population that lives, that form uh, biofilms at the interface between air and water. And these bacterial population grow extremely large with uh, millions and billions of cells, which uh, after a while uh, create some kind of imbalance in the access to nutrients. And when that happens, um, the, the, the access to nutrients means that certain regions can grow faster than others, some imbalance occurs, and the population has to somewhat coordinate its access to, uh, or its, its metabolism. And by observing the dynamics of activity, in fact, of ionic flux through the membrane, throughout the membrane of, of these bacterial populations, these authors identified that there was actually an electrical signal 
that was generated by this potassium flux through the membrane of the bacteria that led to the depolarization of one bacteria by its neighbors that eventually led to a wave of depolarization that travels along that two-dimensional surface. And what you get there is essentially an action potential, an all or none waveform that can travel and communicate information across this population, except that the time scale is very different. Instead of being a millisecond wide, it's 30 minute wide, okay? But this is just a parameter. It doesn't really matter in the sense of finding a principle for communication. You have a digital pulse that's used by a bacterial population, which has, of course, no brain and no nervous system, but that ends up being something that's uh, globally similar to an action potential in a network of neurons, okay? So this is the kind of stuff that I find really interesting, and this is what we're trying to uh, focus on. So what I'll talk about here is three systems that are completely different, an insect, a mollusk, a cephalopod, and then a vertebrate, a reptile, three completely different nervous systems as well. One of them is a olfactory system, another one is a motor system, and the last one is a cortical system. But they all share certain aspects of dynamics of activity within them that I think might be related to one another. And this is what I want to try and explain and, and, and develop here. So we'll start with the locust, go to the, the cephalopod, the cuttlefish, and then finish with the turtle. So the work <clears throat> on olfaction is work that we did uh, when, when we were still at, at Caltech. And that is, in this case, the work that I'll describe, all done in one species, a grasshopper or locust, and its uh, olfactory system. The olfactory system of insects is composed of a nose, which is the antenna that has a large number of receptors. And those converge to a first region of the brain called the antenna lobe, which is the functional analog of the olfactory bulb. And within that structure, you find two types of neurons, local interneurons and projection cells, or projection neurons, or PNs, that are the analogs of the mitral cells that one finds in the olfactory bulb. So we started doing experiments and recording, in this case, with an intracellular electrode from a cell. So here is one neuron being recorded and its response to a pulse of odor at each one of these little rectangles there. And the peculiar thing about the response of these cells is this temporal patterning of spiking, where you can see a burst of spike, an inhibition, a second burst of spike, and this repeats every time you present the stimulus. But if you change the odor to that same neuron, you can see that it also responds to the same odor, but with a temporal pattern that is completely different to the first one. And if you present 50 odors, this cell will respond to nearly all of the odors, but in a slightly different way every time, okay? By contrast, if you change, you put your electrode in a second neuron, the one just neighboring that one, you'll find that, again, that cell will respond to a bunch of different odors with different patterns, but the pattern to this odor could be this one rather than that one. In other words, every neuron responds in a particular way that's stimulus-specific. So the response pattern is both neuron and odor specific, okay? So that makes the understanding of what's going on complicated and we needed to look at activity of populations of neurons rather than single cells. So we went through a series of, of, of experiments eventually up to recording from tens of neurons together and since those are insects and those neurons are uh, identifiable, you can pull these neurons into a larger set. So here I show you a large set of 100 neurons, which is about an eighth of the entire population of such cells. So you're looking at a large fraction of the entire system. So here's the response of an array of 100 neurons to an odor presented during the gray box, which is there. And you can see that many neurons seem to respond, but they all respond in a complicated way and in a way which is not similar to its neighbor. Okay, so it's a distributed activity in space across the neurons and in time. So the way in which we decided to analyze these response patterns is to cut up time into short bins, 
And those short bins are, the, the duration of that bin is informed by some other features that I don't have time to talk about that are an oscillatory pattern with a, a frequency of 20 hertz defining a time window of about 50 milliseconds that represent the period. So we have a time bin of 50 milliseconds and we look at the activity of this vector of, acti of, of activity across these neurons in each one of these time bins. So you have for the first 50 milliseconds of the response, a response vector with zeros and ones that represent whether a neuron has fired or not. So it's a binary vector of activity in 100 dimension. And then you move your bin 50 milliseconds hence, measure the vector of activity across those cells, and do that over the entire period of the response, say two seconds or three seconds. Okay? So now you get a high dimensional vector of activity that changes over time. You get a trajectory within the phase space defined by those 100 dimensions, those 100 neurons, okay? So you can use techniques to reduce that dimensionality to two or three so that you can project this into a low dimensional space as is done here. So in this case, it's PCA, you just project the, the entire activity over the first three P, uh, PCs. And what you find is a trajectory like this that represents this activity here. And each one of these red traces is one trial, and the average is the black trace you see underneath. And the important thing here to see is that the representation of the odor is something that's highly dynamic and deterministic in some way, meaning that it repeats every time. So you have at rest, when no odor is presented, the system lives in some kind of ball of noise where each cell fires independently of all the others. But as soon as the odor turns on, you get an evolution of this uh, trajectory in a systematic way. That if the odor is, remains on for long enough, in this case a second and a half, eventually stabilizes at what we call a fixed point. So the representation of the odor is something that moves over time, hence the tidal neural motion, and eventually stabilizes in a fixed point. And then when you turn the odor off, the system then returns to baseline, but not back through the on path, but through a new path, an off transient, eventually returning to the baseline, this path here, okay? So if you change the odor, then you'll get a different transient that might go in this direction to a different fixed point and then return to baseline when the odor is turned off. The representation is something that moves and varies over time and eventually stabilizes only if the stimulus remains long enough. In olfaction, typically, especially for insects, the duration of a stimulus is basically an air filament that contains odorized air. And an animal moving through it will generally be stimulated for no more than a couple of hundred milliseconds. So in reality, the system never reaches that fixed point and the representation is always dynamic. Okay? Now, when you have this kind of representation, you can play games with the stimulus. For example, present a number of different concentrations of an odor. And what you find is that each concentration generates a different family of trajectories that are nested within one another. Okay? So, if you had an infinite number of concentrations, you'd find that you'd tile this entire surface and you'd find some kind of low dimensional sur surface within that space. We call that a, a low-dimensional manifold. And we think that the, the way to think about a representation of an odor is as low-dimensional manifolds within this large state space. If you present another odor with different concentrations, you define a different manifold uh, that visits other regions of that state space. Okay? Now, the beautiful thing about these small systems is that you can look at the cells that do the decoding, so far, everything we've done is we as observers trying to make sense of this activity. But of course, in a real nervous system, those that make sense of this activity are the cells that are directly downstream of these uh, cells. And those are located in an area that's called the mushroom body that's made of a very large number of very small cells called Kenyan cells, and we can record from them. And when you record from them, you can ask them, when do you respond? Do you respond when the system is in motion, the input is in motion, or when the system has reached a steady state? And what you find is that the system of Kenyan cells responds only 
when the system, the input is in motion. In other words, the decoding of the activity occurs only for the activity which is in motion, which is during the transient. In other words, the steady state, that fixed point, exists, but it's not being decoded by the neurons downstream. So if you think of it from the point of view of measuring activity in a population of neurons, when you measure an average rate, it only makes sense to measure this average rate when you reach a steady state. Here you have no steady state. You only have a steady state at the fixed point, but the fixed point is not decoded. In other words, you have to keep track of these dynamics and this evolving activity in the input population to make sense of it. Okay? Now, how do these canyon cells decode this input? Well, what you find is that the responses of these canyon cells are extremely specific. Contrary to the PNs that I just described that respond to nearly every odor with a different temporal pattern, the canyon cell responds to a very tiny fraction of the odors you present, but with only one or two spikes every time. Okay? And the reason they do so is that they basically sample a very small volume within the state space within which the PN population evolves. So here is, if you will, the receptive field of a canyon cell. <clears throat> it's a small region within that entire phase space. And if the trajectory that's defined by the PN population traverses it, then you get one or two spikes in that canyon cell. As soon as the PN vector moves out of that little region, the cell becomes silent again. Okay? Now, you can play games again with the stimulus. For example, present the same stimulus and then add a second one that will deviate the input trajectory. That's what happens with this red arrow here. You let the stimulus evolve, enter that region that causes a response in the cell, and then add a new odor that moves it out. And as soon as you do that, then the Kenyan cell stops responding. And if you present yet another stimulus that moves outside entirely of this region, the cell doesn't respond at all. Okay? So each Kenyan cell is, if you will, like a spider that has one arm somewhere in that region of state space, which is a huge high dimensional space. And whenever a trajectory traverses that very small region, the Kenyan cell will fire. Now, how do you define that region and why is it large or why is it small? That has all to do with the connection matrix between the population of projection neurons and the population of Kenyan cells. And so we can measure some aspects of this connectivity. We know that there's 800 projection neurons. We know that a Kenyan cell, by some independent measures, is connected on average to about 50% of its inputs, that it is, receives inputs from about 400 projection neurons. So the number of ways that you can activate a Kenyan cell is huge. In addition, the firing threshold of a Kenyan cell is about 100 coincident input. So the number of ways that you can activate a Kenyan cell if it e receives inputs from 400 projection neurons is the number of combinations of 100 out of 400. And this is essentially an infinite number. In other words, instead of being what I just described to you, which is one small volume in that state space, it's actually a very large number of such small volumes distributed in this high dimensional space. And the way in which these little volumes are uh, uh, distributed within that space depends entirely on the nature of that connectivity matrix. And this is something that we don't really understand. And that's very important because it enables a Kenyan cell, for example, to respond to one odor at a variety of different concentrations or to generalize from one odor to a mixture that, course, that contains some of that, uh, that odor as well. And these are some of the remaining mysteries about the way in which this entire system is organized. So what I've shown you here is, as an introduction, if you will, is the complexity of the representation of an olfactory system in this species of insect here, and the importance of the dynamic phase of the response that is given to us by the fact that the Kenyan cells that decode these inputs only respond when the input is in motion. Okay? So this is, in a sense, a proof that the dynamics are critical for decoding by the real nervous system. Okay. So that was the first example, and now I'm going to move to something completely different. 
a motor system uh, in cuttlefish. So I will illustrate this first by this movie, which was taken by Roger Hanlon uh, at Woods Hole uh, several years ago. So what you see here is more than uh, meets the eye. It showed me the full repertoire of what it does. And it was like slow motion. It went from camouflage to bright white to scare me, ink on my face. OK, I'll play it again. It showed me the full repertoire of what it does. And it was like slow motion. It went from camouflage to bright white to scare me, ink on my face. OK. So this is not a cuttlefish, this is an octopus, but it's the same family of what I call colloid uh, cephalopods, squid, cuttlefish, and octopus. And these animals are um, uh, mollusks that evolved very early at a time when fish didn't exist in the oceans, and they lost their external shell. The only cephalopod that has not is Nautilus. And it's imagined that at the time when predators arose, such as bony fish in the ocean, uh, they had to figure out a way of escaping predation. They could have reinvented an external shell. They didn't. They invented this uh, mechanism and this trick of crypsis or camouflage by imitating the substrate on which they lie. Okay? And the way in which they do this is extremely interesting, as you'll see, and for a variety of reasons that I'll try and explain. So this is work that uh, was done over the past uh, four years or so, mostly by Sam Ryder, who's a postdoc in the lab, a number of, of uh, grad students and postdocs, extremely talented, and a, a great collaborator, Matthias Kashube at, at FIAS, uh, next door to us. So here you may detect uh, one cuttlefish, which is located here, uh, lying on a bed of, of, of gravel. And uh, we'll zoom in on the animal. And this camouflage is generated by an array of specialized pigment cells that are called chromatophores that come in a variety of colors. You see here probably three colors, yellow ones, black ones, and then intermediate ones like this one that are red or orange, and so on. Okay. Those chromatophores are specialized pigment cells that you see here that are each connected to a radial array of muscles that can expand them. So there are mechanical pixels that are operated by contraction of muscles, themselves operated by motor neurons that are located in the brain. In other words, every time you see the motion of a chromatophore, you indirectly are looking at the firing rate of a motor neuron that controls the muscles uh, expanding that pigment sac. In other words, you can do imaging by proxy if you can image individual chromatophores. Okay? So each motor neuron controls a small number of, motor neuron, of uh, chromatophores between 1 and possibly 10 in some, certain regions of the body. And each chromatophore is controlled by a very small number of motor neurons, up to 3, possibly no more. So every time you look at a chromatophore, you don't look only at one motor neuron. You might look at two or three. But by being clever about the way in, you, in which you interpret this activity, you might be able to image, essentially, the activity of motor neurons at the same time. So what do we have here? We have an animal in which you can read out its perception of the external world without doing any kind of complicated behavior. It's not a case where you have to train an animal to do a binary discrimination, for example. Here, you just put the animal on a substrate and you read out the animal's own perception of that uh, substrate uh, as a 2D image uh, that, that corresponds to the pattern that it forms on its back. Okay? You're dealing with something which is computationally actually extremely complex, <coughs> texture processing. It's something that uh, computer uh, scientists, machine vision people have been studying for many years. And when you try and quantify and describe mathematically a texture, a 2D texture, uh, you discover that you need hundreds of parameters to describe them. And yet, this thing is completely innate in the animals, and they can generate those patterns and their pattern matching at hatching out of the animal, at, at, out of the egg. In other words, they have in their brain some innate solutions that are independent of learning. Okay? 
So that implies that the solutions which they have must at some level be low dimensional. And that's extremely interesting. And that's what one of the things we're after. You have a system in which you have a proxy for neural recordings without having to go into the brain. Um, and then, as I'll show towards the end of this uh, chapter, you have access to interesting neural dynamics that I'll eventually get to. So what we spent a few years doing is to try and develop techniques to uh, read the activity of these uh, independent chromatophores, okay? monitor them in real time in the behaving animal, and then analyze those patterns after we have uh, essentially registered all the images that form a movie. So we image the animal at 30 to 60 images a second. We image the entire body of the animal so that depending on their age, we have a few thousand to several hundred thousand chromatophores. And then we process these images so as to register them such that we can track the state of any single chromatophore within these images. Okay. So this proved to be a, a, a complex computational problem, as you can imagine. Here is, a, for example, a frame with a set of chromatophores. This is the same animal five minutes later. It has changed its pattern. And what we have to do is to match individual chromatophores from one image or one state to another. So we want to identify the same set of chromatophores here as are there and be able to stitch them all together throughout the life of this animal. So we were very fortunate to identify the fact that the distribution of these chromatophores on the skin is nearly random, meaning that it's unique in any little patch of skin. So every time that you look at a little patch of skin, you have an array of chromatophores whose physical arrangement is essentially a fingerprint. So all you have to do is to cross-correlate that little array, here an array of, say, 64 by 64 pixels, and cross-correlate this with all other regions of another image of the same animal, and there will be only one match that corresponds to the time when you found the same array of chromatophores. So here's a state where you look at the uh, purple ones here and there, where the, the global um, uh, pattern that you find in these two regions is the same, and you can see that they indeed match very well. Here's the 2D correlation between the two. And here is the green ones between this patch and that patch, where the global pattern is very different in the two, but yet the physical arrangement of the, the center of mass of each one of these chromatophores is the same, such that the correlation is high. And indeed, when you compare the correlation between, say, this patch and any other patch on the surface of the animal, most of these correlations are low. Here is all of these correlations that don't match. There's over 200 million such correlations in that, that uh, mode here. And you can see that they are all around zero. And all the outliers here correspond to the real matches. In other words, when you do this over a patch of, say, 20 or so of these little small patches on the surface of the animal, you can match them uniquely, align your images, and do that a few more times, and eventually align the entire animal image by image by image. And you can do this over days of recording. So that's, of course, a lot of images and a lot of uh, computational processes, but eventually reach a point where you have a set of completely registered images where you can track the state of a given chromatophore over however long you've recorded this thing for. So here's an example. If you don't do this match, you get an average image. Here is 237,000 images all put together after a rough match. And after the operation I described, you go through this pipeline of, uh, of registration and you end up with perfectly registered chromatophores uh, that, that basically allow you to do the computation uh, that is the interesting part that we want to do, okay? We have scaled up since this, we have scaled up the system from one camera that allowed us to track animals up to about this size to an array of 24 cameras so that, uh, yeah, so that we can track much larger animals and track them over several months of their life. And we can track now uh, up to 500,000 uh, chromatophores simultaneously over a very long time. So here's a blow up of these chromatophores over the entire thing. So now we have data sets of hundreds of thousands of chromatophores, or ersatz of neurons, if you will, over time, okay? And the fun part now is to analyze the joint statistics of these chromatophores to try and 
deduce from that the neural control of those chromatophores, okay? So here's the logic. You have on the left uh, an average image. On the right, you have a zoom of a small patch and then a stack of such images. And what we can do is simply measure the size of a given chromatophore from one image to the next to the next, and then we get a time series that represents the state of that chromatophore over time. But of course, we can do that over all the chromatophores that we have. And now we can look at the joint statistics of motion of each one of these chromatophores. And if, for example, those chromatophores are postsynaptic to the same motor neurons, forming a motor unit, then the correlation will be one. They'll always be correlated with one another. And then on the basis of the degree of correlation between these chromatophores, we can hierarchically classify the set of control and eventually deduce from this a hypothesis about the neural control of the population. And this is what we did. Here is an example where here is a dorsal surface of the animal. Here's a, a region that we focus on. Here's a small region with about 20 chromatophores that you can see here. And you can see that during this period of time, all of these chromatophores are coordinated uh, together. But a little earlier, only that subset was coordinated and represents a true motor unit, okay? So by looking at this degree of correlation, eventually we can form a hierarchical clustering of, of, uh, uh, of this activity across uh, the different uh, chromatophores, but over these tens of thousands of chromatophores. And reach a description such as this one that represents the degree of correlation between them, where at the bottom here are all the chromatophores and the units that are most correlated with one another and a, a set of hierarchical levels with lower and lower correlation, okay? And so what do these correspond to? At the lowest level here, what you have are the, the, motor, the motor units, basically the set of chromatophores that are postsynaptic to a single motor neuron. And what you find is that they form little clumps. All these different groups here are chromatophores that are postsynaptic to a single motor neuron. But then as you move up this uh, hierarchical clustering here, you find larger clusters, such as this one or that one, that represents groupings of those, okay, that presumably represent the control of those motor units by higher order neurons responsible for the formation of these sub-patterns, for example, a band or a clump and so on. And as you move up that hierarchical uh, uh, diagram here, you end up with presumed neurons whose activity is responsible, for example, for the formation of a large rectangle, which, which is what you see here, okay? So from the analysis of the joint statistics of all of these chromatophores, you can deduce a hypothesis about the neural control of the system, okay? And this is what we're in the business of doing at the moment with a much greater variety of of patterns and pattern matching systems uh, in, in different animals. But now what I want to do is to return to dynamics. Here's a movie, you'll see the animal, a hand is moved in front of the animal and you've seen the animal change pattern in this way. So this is a kind of, we call that blanching. It's a very reliable behavior when the animal is slightly startled by, for example, a predator or uh, in this case, a moving hand. This is still moving, you see the animal breathing, but you see that little by little, the animal is returning to its original pattern, okay? So now we have uh, a change in pattern in this animal, okay, as a function of time. It takes about a minute to go through the entire cycle. And we can characterize this quantitatively as a vector of chromatophore states, where we measure the state of each chromatophore in a like in this case, over 17,000 different chromatophores, measure their state in a given image that, that now becomes a vector of chromatophore states, and then look at it over time. It's exactly the same analysis as we did earlier with the neurons, except now it's with chromatophores. Now it's a 17,000 dimensional state, uh, uh, state space. We're going to project that into two or three dimensions to kind of see it, and then that becomes that. And that trajectory here, represents one of these cycles, as you saw in the movie earlier. So it's the evolution of the pattern of the animal as a function of time, okay? So it went from this pattern to that one, 
And then you may have observed that when the animal was returning to the black pattern here, he went through this kind of intermediate state with this weird band in the middle. Okay. And now look at what happens when the animal moves from here to there over repeated trials. There's three or four trials here repeated, one after the other. And what you observe is that every time the animal is returning from here to there, not in a straight line, but through this very systematic path that goes through these intermediate patterns. Okay? Now, that's the interesting part to me, because there is no particular reason to think that it should do that. It's actually not an optimal way from an energetic point of view to go through these intermediate patterns. And it's not obvious at all either that you should go through any such intermediate pattern. So remember that it's a motor system. It's like when we move an arm. But when we move an arm, we have a physical plant that we have to move. And so we have a lot of physical constraints on motion. We cannot, I cannot move my hand from here to there in any possible way. There are some ways that are forbidden by the physics of the arm. Okay? But in a case like this, it is not true. Because every chromatophore is independent of its neighbors, or every group of chromatophores controlled by the same motor neuron is independent of the other. And the motion of one chromatophore has no effect on the motion of the other. So in principle, at the level of the physical plant that generates this pattern, there's no reason why you should go through this in intermediate state. So what we think is that what we have here is the consequence of the existence of low dimensional control system that forces the system to go from A to B in terms of states through some very specific path. Okay, And this you can see directly in this slide, where to illustrate how similar these paths are, I show you three images that are taken at the same time during this return loop. Okay, So here is one, here's the second, here's the third. We zoom in on this thing, and now look at the identity of the chromatophores that form the edge. I'm going to point them with arrows. These different images are taken two minutes apart as the animal has moved from one pattern to the next and back. Okay? And yet, every time, the nature of this border between the light and the dark area is defined by the same subset of chromatophores with the same set of diameters. It's remarkable. So you have a very high dimensional display system with tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of pixels, and yet the types of patterns that they can generate is limited by, presumably, the neural circuitry that's responsible for generating them. So what we think we're looking at here is a readout of the low dimensionality of this representation. And this low dimensionality is also imposed by what I was telling you earlier, which is the fact that these patterns are innate. They're not learned meaning that if you wanted to encode a system that can generate any kind of pattern in the genome of this animal, it would be incredibly complex. It's a huge brain with millions and hundreds of millions of neurons. So there has to be somewhere in the nervous system of this animal some kind of low dimensional representation of the patterns that they can generate. And of course, we don't know what this representation is. We're after it. This is basically moving back from the patterns that we can analyze into the nervous system. This is what we're after. And we think that this low dimensional representation is in fact the cause for the similarity of paths that are taken by the nervous system. Okay. So again, it's another example where what we have here, what we think we have here, is the expression of the fact that in a nervous system, if you want to move from one state to another, there are constraints on the path that you can take. And those constraints are given by the connectivity of the system and its dimensionality. And we think we have an expression of this in this particular system. So that was the second uh, example, and I want now to go to the third one, it will be possibly a li little quicker, which is yet again completely different and concerns the cerebral cortex, in this case the, cere the cerebral cortex of turtles. <laughs> 
So this is work that's been done by a fantastic grad student, uh, Mike Hamburger, uh, over the past uh, five years. It's been done on the cortex of this, uh, of this one of the two model systems that we study. And it's done on this region of cortex, which we call dorsal cortex, which we know, thanks to Maria's uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq, to be uh, analogous to what will become the neocortex of uh, mammalian cortex, okay? So the beautiful thing about these reptilian systems is that these animals, in particular turtles, are resistant to hypoxia. So you can take the brain out of the animal and keep it alive in a dish in saline for several days. You can even keep it attached to the eyes or the eyes attached to the brain, present stimuli to the eye and record activity within the cortex itself. Then you can uh, put a couple of, of uh, transverse cuts through the cortex here and then unflap the cortex and flatten it on the surface of a microelectrode array. And because the cortex is thin, it's about 200 microns thick, and the single cell layer of pyramidal cells is about 50 microns away from the ventricular surface, you can, with that MIA, that microelectrode array, record the activity of pyramidal cells and interneurons. And typically, you can record from 300 to 1,200 neurons with a one square millimeter array of electrodes. Okay. We developed techniques to analyze these patterns, and we discovered, looking in detail at, uh, at, at the, the spiking responses of cells, that when you open your filters, following the spike of any, any neurons that produce an action potential, there's always a low frequency signal following it that represents the synaptic uh, consequences of, of release from the neurons that has just produced an action potential. And they come in two polarities, here and there, that are correlated with whether the neurons are excitatory or inhibitory. In other words, from the sign of this low frequency signal, you can define whether it's an excitatory neuron or an interneuron. And this <clears throat> categorization is much more reliable than the width of the action potential itself. So you can record from hundreds of neurons with a MIA, Okay, and you can classify those neurons are, as in, <coughs> interneurons or projection neurons. Sorry, I have a cold in there. <clears throat> so the, the experiments that I'm going to show you now um, involve no motor output or uh, sensory input, but it, they're <clears throat> all done in a isolated patch of cortex of a few square millimeters of which the central square millimeter is placed directly onto the MIA, okay? With that, we can record from hundreds of projection neurons or pyramidal cells and interneurons. And Mike is going to patch one cell going through the PIA up to the cell layer, patch one pyramidal cell, and inject a current pulse in that pyramidal cell to make it fire. And what we're going to look at is the consequence of firing that single pyramidal cell, okay? <clears throat> so you can see that illustrated there, patch uh, pyramidal cell with a MIA record from this population of cells. So here is the current pulse, in this case a two second long current pulse. This is the voltage of that pyramidal cell. You can see that that cell fires two actual potentials here, and then there is this hyperpolarization there. If you repeat this, you get this hyperpolarization repeated many times. Okay, and it's in fact, you can see it's made of compound IPSPs, right? And these IPSPs are generated by interneurons that we can record from that are within that square millimeter of cortex that have been activated by that single pyramidal cell, okay? So for example, the first two uh, lines that you see here are uh, the rasters of two interneurons that are directly connected to this one causing the IPSP in that single cell. So what this says is that two spikes from a pyramidal cell are sufficient to activate a negative feedback onto that same cell, okay? But in fact, you can see that two spikes from that cell are enough to activate over 60 different neurons within that same little patch of cortex, okay? So an incredibly efficient way of activating the cortex with only a couple of spikes, okay? 
So what we're going to do now is to focus on those cells that are activated by just a few spikes coming from that patch neuron. And we're going to call those cells follower cells. They're defined or selected with a reliability criterion, meaning we provide hundreds of those uh, pulses and we put a threshold on the number of pulses, the fraction of pulses, within which those cells will respond. We put a threshold, X percent, and we're going to select those. So we're going to look at the activity of those reliable cells, which we call followers. So here's a set of followers for that particular experiment. There's, I don't know, 13 or 14 of them. Um, they're in uh, random order. And what I'm going to do now is to reorder them by rank. The first, then the second, and the third to spike, okay? So you get a sequence. That's, of course, a consequence of reordering them. And now we're going to keep that order and show the activity of this set of cells over repeated trials, repeated pulses, okay? And this is what you see there. So there's 10 trials, or, yeah, 10 trials here. And this is the same set of cells in the same order. And you can see that every time you get this sequential activation of these neurons, as a consequence of only two spikes coming from that pyramidal cell that has been patched. You can see that there is some noise, but if you make a raster here with all of the first cell, the second cell, the third, etc., you can see that the distribution of spike times of those cells is actually very narrow, with a, a jitter of about five milliseconds. And you can see that it unfolds over time. Okay. So here's a set of other examples. It's a single, so it's a different prep here, a different uh, uh, pyramidal cell, a single spike, and you get a set of followers. You inject a little more current for a little longer. You get two spikes now. You activate more followers that form, again, a sequence. Yet another prep. And um, here, a set of preps, uh, a set of trials for uh, yet another prep, just to show you the reliability of this activation, OK? An example with a cell that activated 16 different followers that we could uh, identify, and another one that activated 33 that we could follow. And if you put all of these things together of all the preps, you get an activation that unfold over up to 200 milliseconds after only two spikes from a patched pyramidal cell, okay? So you activate one pyramidal cell, you record from cortex, and what you see is that a small fraction of the cells are activated reliably in a sequential fashion, okay? Here is a cell that's activated about 100 milliseconds later, and you can see that it's reliably activated over here. I don't know how many trials like. 25 or so. So um, an interesting observation is this, that when you look at the timing of the spikes of these follower neurons, it looks as if there are quantal steps in this activation. And those quantal steps are on the order of 6 to 8 milliseconds. The first cell is activated one millisecond or so after the patched neuron, and then the next one will be 6 to 8 milliseconds later, and so on. As you move forward in time, it becomes more and more jittery, and it's much more difficult to identify those things. But this particular uh, quantal increment, if you will, in delay, is something that you can see also when you look at subthreshold activity, and that's what I'm going to show here. So here, Mike is recording with multiple patch, up to eight. And I'm going to show you a few with uh, just uh, two or three. So here's a presynaptic cell that he's patching. And then here's a cell that's directly postsynaptic, connected to the first one with this EPSP. But you can see that there's a second EPSP riding on top of the first, even though that cell has not fired two action potentials. So that second, act, uh, second uh, EPSP has to be caused by some other cell that's not recorded, that has been activated reliably by that neuron when it fired. Okay? And you can see that the time delay between the first and the second PSP is about 8 milliseconds. Here's another example. Same uh, thing. Cell patched, fires. Second cell uh, patched. Uh, shows an EPSP after, uh, in this case, one millisecond or so. And then a second EPSP about uh, twice eight milliseconds later. 
okay? But extremely reliably as well, even though there has been no action potential in that cell again, which implies that some other cell has been recruited, or maybe several cells have been recruited between this EPSP and that one. And if you look at, you do that over a number of preparations like this, and you look at the timing of each one of these EPSPs, they form a quantized distribution with an interval of about six to eight milliseconds every time. So what we think we're do, looking at here is whenever a, a, a pyramidal cell is activated, it activates a subset of neurons, some of which are activated above spike threshold, and when they fire, they themselves activate another layer of neurons and so on, such that this activity can propagate. Hence the formation of that little wave and that cascade of activation across the system. So this kind of polysynaptic PSP here is something that has been described uh, once, as far as I'm aware, in human prefrontal cortex by Molnar et al. a few years ago in slices of prefrontal cortex. They found that when they patched several cells, they could find things that look like this, except that the transmission of this activity, they estimate, is caused by depolarizing EPSPs caused by interneurons. Okay. In this case, we know that they're caused by pyramidal cells. So if what I'm telling you is true, it implies that the activation of intermediate neurons to propagate this activity must be, in some cases, extremely reliable, meaning there has to be some very strong connections for these to work. So we plot here uh, a distribution of PSP amplitudes for all, a, a number of different uh, paired recordings. And what you can see is that that distribution is very heavy-tailed with a small number of very powerful EPSPs of many millivolts. The largest one was 20 millivolt amplitude. And those PSPs are probably those that are sufficient to, upon the production of a single action potential in one cell, generate an action potential reliably in another cell that eventually propagates to another. And given that every pyramidal cell makes thousands of outputs, among those outputs are some that are extremely reliable and they must be responsible for the early propagation of this activity. But of course, as you move from the first cell to the first order neurons to the second order neurons, this activity then diverges. And then the requirement for having strong potentials is not as strong because you can, you can have convergence as well. By divergence and convergence, you can then propagate this activity without requiring very strong synapses. And we think this is what happens, and this is in part why the jitter tends to increase as you progress in time. So here's an example, you can see this. Here's pre and post, two spikes, two PSPs and then a spike. Here's pre and post, one spike, you get one spike. One spike, you get two PSPs. So again, here, indirect uh, reflection of the fact that there's got to be some other cell that's been activated by that one to get the second EPSP. Okay. As I was saying, when you move forward in time and you look at the timing of the cells that are late in the response, in the sequence, and you look at the jitter of onset time of these cells, you see that that jitter increases as a function of the delay. This is delay. This is the jitter. And you can see that overall, there is a somewhat of a linear, you can do a linear regression through this thing. So on, on average, it tends to increase with the delay. But you see that there are cells at the bottom here whose response is still extremely reliable, meaning very low jitter, about five milliseconds, even when they respond 150 milliseconds after the onset. This is remarkable. You activate one cell, 150 milliseconds later, meaning you've gone through a chain of neurons, maybe 10 or more, and you still get a response in a postsynaptic cell uh, with such a low jitter. And then if you look at the spatial propagation of this thing, you see this. So we can, of course, for all the cells that were recorded with the MIA, triangulate their position. Okay? So we can look at the physical propagation of this activity uh, as a function of space, as well as a function of time. So here is the trajectory of the response of those followers as a function of time in one trial, a second trial, three trials. You can see how reliable it is. Every time it's activating the same cells. And then if you do that over a number of different preparations, you can see for each one of them this propagation away from the site of initiation of the activity. 
Okay? So in every case, it moves away uh, centrifugally from uh, the, the source cell. And now the last experiment and the last piece of data is an experiment involving two source neurons. So in this case, Mike is patching two pyramidal cells, recording this activity across the MIA from hundreds of neurons. And we're going to look at what happens when he stimulates one cell alone, the other cell alone, and then the two cells together, and then the two cells together with a small delay between them. Okay? So here is cell one, activates a small number of, of follower cells, only three here. Cell two activates a larger number of follower cells, which you can see there. They actually don't overlap at all with one another, even though those two cells are very close to each other. Repeat stimulus of cell one, repeat stimulus of cell, uh, stimulus of cell two, and now one plus two. And now you get a new set of followers that overlap partially with the followers of cell two and the followers of cell one, but it's not exactly the sum of the two. And now the more interesting thing is stimulate two then one, okay, with 10 millisecond difference between the onset of two and the onset of one, and you activate a new set of followers in this case, and now reverse the order, one then two, and this set of followers is silent, and you get a new set of followers in this case. In other words, the timing of the activation of the two source cells is reflected in the timing of the cells that are the followers, but also their identity. Okay? So you can imagine the sort of combinatorics uh, that result from this sort of activation across the population. So to summarize, what we have here is the uh, expression of activity across a slab of cortex that is the consequence of activation of a single pyramidal cell that is, in essence, very similar to everything I showed you earlier for the olfactory system in the sense that what you have here is a set of neurons, a vector of pyramidal cells and interneurons that changes as a function of time, in this case not triggered by the presence of an olfactory stimulus but the activation of a single cell. Okay? So in principle, we're looking at the dynamical activation of a slab of cortex as a result of a source stimulus, which is, in this case, a very simple one, the minimal one, one or two spikes in a pyramidal cell. You can think of it in this way, as a landscape of firing probability across this slab of cortex, where you activate one cell, and that cell, by virtue of its connectivity with its neighbors, will tend to activate a subset, and that subset, by virtue of its own connectivity with the rest, will activate another subset in such a way that you define a probability, a firing probability profile or landscape that characterizes that cell. It's a different way of thinking of it than looking at a connection matrix. But of course, that firing profile would be different if the context were different. If that spike occurred in the context of yet another spike coming from another cell, that landscape would be different. Okay? So the way in which to think about this thing is that you have a very plastic system in which the interconnectivity between these neurons is extremely high, but generates constraints on the way in which this activity can propagate at the population level as a function of the input and as a function of the state that the system finds itself in. Okay? So why all this and what could that be relevant for? So the kind of stuff that I showed you for the total cortex here, for some of you may remind you of stuff that has been described by Moshe Abeles in particular that he calls the SINFAR chain. It's this activity, this, this principle that by activating some cells, you should in principle see a chain of activation across cortex. And it's a hypothesis that he put forward uh, 30 years ago in a, in a book. Uh, which has so far received very little strong experimental support, and he would be the first one to admit it. So what we have and what I just show you here is pretty close to this hypothesis, in fact. You have the beautiful body of work that's been done in uh, rat and, and um, rodent hippocampus, in particular in CA1, with this phenomenon of replay. 
during a shockwave ripple, during sleep or rest, you get a short burst of activity that might last 100 and 200 milliseconds. And during that time, you get a sequence of activation of CA1 pyramidal cells that recapitulates in a forward or backward direction the experience that the animal has had when it was moving uh, in a particular environment. We don't know the mechanisms underlying these uh, replay events. Okay, I'm not saying that what I'm describing here explains this, but in the end, you're looking in hippocampus at the cortical structure, which is the closest to a reptilian cortex, uh, basically a three-layer cortex with one layer of pyramidal cells. Maybe there is something to learn uh, from one to the other. Another beautiful example is the stuff that's been done by um, Richard Hanloser, Michael Fee, Michael Long, and others on the song system of, of birds, of zebra finches. And in this nucleus called HVC, you get this sequence of very sparsely responding cells during the generation of a song. And the sequence is sparse in the sense that each neuron fires only once in a very narrow window of time of a few milliseconds. And the generation of the song is characterized by a sequential activation of these cells. Again, we don't know what generates this, but a hypothesis is that it is caused by the sequential activation in a way that is described for the, the cortex there. Now you have larger scale stuff, so the, the, the stuff that I showed you for olfaction. There is work that was done by Kevin Brigman for his PhD uh, on, on behavioral choice in, in leeches. You have stuff from uh, uh, Chris Harvey, David Tank on, on behavioral choice in rats, again in hippocampus. And then you have uh, work in motocortex in primates uh, done by, by Krishna Shanoi, uh, Mark Churchland, and, 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 and others, that also indicates the existence of these trajectories of activation in premotor cortex preceding the actual activation of a limb, for example. So the unfolding of activity in cortical uh, uh, systems. So the question of masking and what I'm interested in, I don't have the answer, is whether we're looking here every time at something which is the expression of a very similar phenomenon, that is the propagation of activity through nervous systems in a quote-unquote deterministic manner that's uh, determined by, constrained by, the connectivity matrix of the system and the dynamics of the neurons that result from that. Okay, so it's a hypothesis, but it's something that I'm really interested in, in, in finding the answer to, obviously. So with this, I'm done. I want to uh, acknowledge the wonderful people that I've been privileged to work with. Sam, who worked with uh, the cuttlefish system. Mike, who did uh, all the work with the turtle uh, uh, sequences. Uh, Maria, the single cell uh, RNA-seq. Mark, who developed many of the techniques for MIA recordings. And Lorenz, who did a lot of the uh, basic molecular biology and genetics to try and apply a number of tools that have been developed for uh, mammalian uh, physiology to the total system. My Caltech lab for all the work in uh, the locus system and Matthias Kashube at FIAS for uh, his collaboration with the cuttlefish system. And with this, I thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat>